so first up tonight is um, Maxime, and he is talking about isomorphic JavaScript with Nashorn. I just learned how to pronounce it. I was pronouncing it with two H's and a sh sound, Nashorn, which is totally incorrect. Um, anyway, yeah, I totally lobbed a, ball, a bomb on him and like was like, hey, we're going to cut your ha talk in half right now. So he is um, probably stewing at me a little bit, but I he's awesome for, for playing, playing along. So anyway, he is going to join us now. Give him a big round of applause for Maxime. It's great to be here. Thank you, Michael. Uh, I, I'm pretty impressed with the group here and uh, first time here. So um, today I'm talking about isomorphic JavaScript with Nashorn. Um, just a little bit about me. Uh, I'm, uh, I live here in Carlsbad, actually, uh, down the street. Uh, I work at Walmart Labs in Carlsbad. I'm a software architect. I work for the platform team. And I'm actually doing a, a Java 1 talk on this subject. So this is a more condensed version of that talk. And I've uh, been working on co-authoring a book on building isomorphic JavaScript apps. It's an O'Reilly book that's going to be coming out next year. We have an er early release coming out uh, in a month or so. So look out for that. So why am I talking about JavaScript at Java 1? You know, and um, that's a question that I think many people would, would have in mind. And uh, Jer Jeremy Keith had this quote. He said, Java is to JavaScript as ham is to hamster. And, <laughs> There's a, whole, there's a whole site on JavaScript is not Java, uh, so you can check that out. But I, I think there are three reasons why Java developers should be talking about JavaScript. Oh, sorry. So one of, I, uh, one of the reasons is this, if you look at this Red Monk uh, language ranking, I think many of you have probably seen this. It's taking uh, the number of projects on GitHub, comparing it to the number of tags on Stack Overflow. And if we list the languages, it's JavaScript and Java are the, the top two among the, the list. And if you look at how many modules there are out there, you know, in, in, in for example, Maven Central and, and in NPM, uh, that red line there is actually uh, NPM modules. So that's the JavaScript modules uh, uh, published. And you can see that that's growing uh, exponentially. That little blue line, I don't know if you can see that, that's, that's Maven. Uh, that's the Maven Central. That's the Java uh, uh, repo. So, Definitely, JavaScript has passed uh, Java in terms of how many modules are available. So more people, it seems like, are actively working on JavaScript projects. And you're more likely to probably find an open source project on JavaScript now than you would have on, on Java. The second reason is that uh, JavaScript has become the platform for building very rich and highly interactive web apps. So in, in the past decade, we've seen the web really evolve. Uh, it's no longer simply documents linked together. This is the original web page that was uh, out there. Uh, basically, it was used by scientists to link their documents together. Um, it's, a, it's text with hyperlinks, right? This was the original initial web era. Then we had the uh, Ajax era. Google came out with their Gmail in 2004. Other people were doing this a little before Google. But uh, now I can stay on the page and I can reply to an email. I can, I can see you know, uh, new messages come in without having to refresh the entire page. And now we're kind of in the single page application web era where I uh, have something like Facebook where you're, having your, 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 you're seeing your friends' streams and, and you're seeing uh, communicating with them all in kind of this application running within your browser. So JavaScript has really enabled websites to evolve into becoming web apps. And, uh, and really, it's the JavaScript in the browser that's made, the, the, uh, made a, a, a runtime for us to run our applications. Now, the third reason is kind of contrary to the second, but that JavaScript isn't only for the browser. Uh, many, when people think about JavaScript, they're thinking about browser APIs like window, document, you know, that's what people usually think about when they think about JavaScript. But if you look at a, brow if you look at a web browser, there's actually two components. There's the rendering engine, which is where your HTML and CSS go, and then there's the scripting engine, which is where your JavaScript is running. And really, your scripting engine is talking to these browser APIs to change and to paint this, the web page on the screen. So you're using the document and things like that, calling it through your scripting engine to update uh, the, the, the HTML and CSS. And each of these you know, uh, browsers have their own implementation. Firefox has Gecko and SpiderMonkey. 
Um, Chrome has its Blink and V8, Trident and Charcot for IE, and Safari has WebKit and Nitro. But if we, if we just look and we focus just on the scripting engines themselves, and we, you know, let's just focus on example for V8, uh, why not, and throw that into a, a server running Node.js, and you throw in an um, IO, kind of an asynchronous IO libraries that uh, allow you to do kind of asynchronous things that you would, the browser kind of normally does. And you still have your, your web browser who has its rendering engine and its scripting engine. So now I have a scripting engine both on the browser and the server. And these, these two are communicating with each other. And now I can run JavaScript both on the browser and the server. Uh, this is referred to as isomorphic JavaScript. Sometimes people have used now uh, the term universal JavaScript or portable JavaScript or shared JavaScript. The idea is that my web application takes on the same form regardless of whether it's running in the browser or the server. So it's, it, isomorphic JavaScript is, is essentially sharing my JavaScript code between my server and then either like a web browser or my mobile uh, phone or an Internet of Things device. You know, it's a, it's a very broad topic. But I want to focus on two things. One, one is that isomorphic JavaScript allows uh, better code maintenance. It's going to allow me to stay dry. I don't have to repeat the same code both on the server and the client. I could use that same code on both sides. And the other aspect is server-side rendering. Now, I showed you how the web has evolved to becoming very client-centric. But it turns out that server-side rendering is very critical to the business. Uh, I work at Walmart, and Walmart is, is, is trying to compete with Amazon. Actually, um, it, it's, it's trying very hard to do that. And what, what Walmart and Amazon both uh, have, have investigated is that the initial page load performance, uh, if you, you can improve it by 100 milliseconds, that's going to be a 1% kind of incremental revenue for the business. So that initial page load, that first time that user goes to your site, uh, downloading all that JavaScript, all that uh, uh, basically rendering the JavaScript and then being able to display something, we want to, to show him something right away, show him the HTML right away. So that initial page load is really important. The other is search engine optimization. People want to search and they want to buy things online. And uh, we know that Google does run your JavaScript. It crawls the site. It will run JavaScript. Uh, but other, there's other search engines uh, that, that don't do that. They just crawl your site as, as if it was HTML. And then for mobile users who are basically a large percentage of, of, of business now uh, who, who are on low bandwidth, that initial kind of getting that server-side rendered HTML to them as soon as possible is, is very critical. So if I look at uh, my client and my server, I have models, I have my uh, internalization, uh, localization, my uh, view logic, my routing controlling, my fetching, my views. I'm kind of duplicating those on the server and the client. And typically, you have on the client, you have some kind of JavaScript framework like React, Backbone, Ember. And on the server, you have either like Spring MVC for Java or Ruby on Rails. And so you have two different languages with each doing the same things uh, if I want to do server-side rendering on both sides. One thing I can do is try to share the view. And this is where logic list templates became very popular, handlebars, mustache. These things became very popular because I can now share my view between the server and the client in different languages because it's logic list. And then I can apply logic either in, in Java or JavaScript on, on both sides. The other thing is trying to share view logic. This is how you get started. You try to sh share a template between the server and the client. And then you realize you need to also share the view logic. And then you still have your localization concerns. And then you eventually want to kind of have both your code running both on the client and the server to, to have that kind of, you know, not to have that duplication. So this is where isomorphic rendering comes. I, I use JavaScript to render on the server and the client. I render the full, full HTML of a JavaScript app on the server. I return that HTML on, that, on a new page request. And then the JavaScript loads and bootstraps the application without destroying or rebuilding the, the initial HTML that the server generated. So isomorphic JavaScript sounds amazing. But you know, what if my front-end servers are running Java? What do I do then? And these Java servers are battle-tested in production. I can't, now that I saw V8 running on Node, I can't just throw away my Java app servers and now let me just run Node. So there are three possible solutions. One is to kind of delegate execution of JavaScript to an internal process running Node. So how that would look like is 
my, uh, I make a page request, it goes to my front end server that's running Tomcat or, or, uh, you know, or Spring MVC, and then it's calling, running a node on the server itself and then calling it node to render a component that I might have want to render and getting HTML back from that. HTML comes back to the app, uh, Tomcat server and it constructs that onto the page and then returns that back uh, to the browser. The drawbacks here is a more complicated deployment. You have the performance overhead of, of interacting with an external process. The second option is very similar. It's kind of reversing the two, running Node in front of Java as a smart proxy. So the request actually goes into to Node. I do my routing in my JavaScript in Node. And then I call into Tomcat to do um, you know, my kind of application logic, that, that uh, uh, battle-tested business logic that I, uh, well, that I want to keep returning data and then constructing that into an HTML page and then returning it back to the browser. Again, more complicated deployment and the performance overhead. The third option, which is the option I want to talk about here today, is, is running JavaScript in the JVM with Nashorn. This is kind of natively running it in, in the JVM itself. So instead of Node, here I'm putting Tomcat. And instead of V8, I'm going to put uh, Nashorn. So if you're not familiar with uh, Java 8 Nashorn, this is the embedded JavaScript engine that comes as part of Java 8. If you're running Java 8, it's already there. It replaces uh, Rhino, which was its, uh, uh, a previous JavaScript engine for Java. It supports ECMAScript 5.1 um, with some extensions. Um, future versions of Nashorn will support ECMAScript 6, but what most people are doing now is they take their ECMA, uh, ES6 uh, JavaScript and then use something like Babel to compile down to, to, to uh, ECMAScript 5. So it's very possible to still do ECMAScript 6. And then your JavaScript code is actually being compiled down to Java bytecode. So I have this complete interoperability between Java and JavaScript. I can call Java within my JavaScript and, and, and my, within my JavaScript code to call Java code. And uh, the, the by, by doing that, you actually get all the memory management and the just-in-time optimizations that the JVM provides, the man decades of high-tech that are already built into the JVM. And one way to visualize this is if you look at the code bases that it took to implement V8, uh, SpiderMonkey, and Nashorn, you'll see that Nashorn actually is, is a much smaller code base because what Nashorn relies on is the JVM to do the memory management and the optimizations that V8 and SpiderMonkey now have to implement, right? So it's, this is kind of to show you that um, how, how much it utilizes the, the, under, underneath, uh, the JVM underneath it. So to how do you execute uh, JavaScript in Java? Well, you get, um, you instantiate a JavaScript engine manager, and then you can, you can get the engine by referring to it as Nashorn. This gives you the, the JavaScript script engine. And then you can evaluate JavaScript directly. You can say print hello world, or you can pass it a JavaScript file, and then a file reader, then that file gets evaluated uh, within, within Nashorn. So here's a, a, here's a simple hello world example. I have a hello world in, in JavaScript that takes in a name, will print hello, and then, and then the name, and then return a string. So if I invoke that through, through Java, I, I get the Nashorn script engine. I, I read the hello world JavaScript file. And then I'll invoke the function hello world passing in Java 1. And then what you'll end up printing out is hello Java 1, greetings from JavaScript, which was the result that I got back from hello world. And then, but if I look at that object that I got back and I do a get class, it's actually a Java string. So here Java is kind of uh, changing the JavaScript to the Java objects uh, back and forth. So I'm passing Java objects to JavaScript and JavaScript returning back Java objects. This is great because now if I, have, if I want to take, like, for example, like Moment, I don't know if you've used Moment before, but this allows you to do formatting of, of dates. Uh, previously, I had to write this on both the server and the client if I wanted to format a date. But here, I can create a JavaScript function that uses Moment, passes in a language and, and a timestamp, and then I can invoke that within, within my Java code. I just say date from now and then pass in the locale and timestamp. And so the same Java code here, date for now, and the same JavaScript code will return me the same code four years ago in French. But uh, you see that now I can use that same code to execute and return the same string. Take, for example, handlebars. Now I could take that date format. I can make that into a handlebars helper. There is handlebars Java, and there is handlebars JS. But now I can't share the, the helpers between them. 
And this, this will allow me to do that. I can, I can in, in, um, register a JavaScript helper into handlebars, and then I can call that from Java. I can say, you know, pass in the timestamp and call handlebars from the JavaScript side. I pass in a comment, it, it will uh, put the uh, date format and, and convert my timestamp. But what would a good talk about JavaScript be without React, right? So let's talk about server-side React. React is uh, isomorphic by out of the box because I can take React components and I could render them to the string to a string, and return that uh, to the browser, and then have React pick up where the server left off. So here's a simple Hello World React component. Um, it's just going to return a div with Hello World. On the on the server side, I can do React uh, render to string. And then I get back this uh, output with, uh, with Hello World in the div. But you'll notice there's a checksum attribute. This is, this is React being very smart about reusing the DOM from the server. So when it gets onto the client, it checks that checksum and then, and then doesn't have to re-render that, uh, that element again because it knows that it, it, it's, it was generated by React. So let me take now uh, and build a full like React uh, server-side rendering in, in Java. Uh, here I have, uh, I will put a small polyfill. Uh, um, React does use the console. There is no console in Nashorn. So I just simply polyfill it to do nothing because I don't really need the console. I just need the, the string that comes out of a React render to string. And then I build a server bundle. And so I have a build process that takes my React components. I use Webpack that's going to now compile that into a bundle file. That, that bundle file is not for the browser. It's actually for my server. And so now I could, I could give that to Nashorn, have it read, read that, um, that bundle. Now I have like a context object, very similar to, to ever, if you ever use Node's VM uh, modules. You have a context, and now I'm going to run code within that context. So I'm going to call render to string, sending in a list of products. And what I get back is HTML with, with a div with a, list of, with a list of products. And then on the client, I can take that uh, content that was generated on the server, put it into a div. And then I could take the data that I used to generate that React component on the server and put it into some kind of window state of some type. And then on the client code, I, I give the, uh, uh, the JS content here, and I say React render passing in the, the window state and the element that I, I just fetched. And then the output is, the, is exactly the same. In fact, uh, um, in this case, uh, in this case, uh, React doesn't do anything. It's, it's already there. It doesn't have to re-render it. So there are some issues with concurrency in Nashorn. There's, so uh, there are some drawbacks here. Um, in a web browser, there is no concurrent execution of code, but Nashorn itself is not thread safe. So really, thread safety is, really depends on your JavaScript code. So one way to work around that is you use the script engine within a thread local. So you only with a given thread is only using one instance of a script engine at a time. So, uh, so this is a way to run handlebars, which is not thread safe. React is not thread safe. So you can run those in Nashorn using this thread local uh, trick. And in terms of performance, I, ha I put a micro benchmark out there. Um, and basically, if I take a React component, I render it many times. The initial time, uh, Nashorn is going to be slower than if I did it in Node.js. But after 10 times, it does get a little closer. And then about after 1,000 iterations, I'm now getting the same performance rendering React components in Java and in Node. So uh, there is a cost to warm-up time. But I, of course, you can always uh, work around that, have that kind of uh, warmed up beforehand. Um, but this is one of the things that they are working on to kind of, and they're doing some interesting things in terms of how to make uh, Nashorn uh, warm up faster. So let me show you a, a few demos. Um, one is I'm going to build um, an Isomorphic app. Um, so this is a, a, a very simple application. I have a home controller here, and it's just going to take a list of movies. So I'm going to call the get movies on a, on a service. And uh, from this list of movies, I'm going to call React Render Movies. This is all done in, on, on the server side using Java. I have a little flag to turn it on and off server side rendering. I'm going to get the data that I use, the list of movies, and I'm going to put content and data both in my model. And so that's what's going to end up on my page. Um, just a quick look at React here. Again, this is the Snazhorn polyfill. And this is the server bundle that I used uh, Webpack to build this, uh, this file. So let me actually uh, open up the browser here. Uh, this is, uh, it basically gets a list of movies. It's going to use a React component to render this uh, carousel. 
Um, it's a basically a carousel of, of movie images, and you could click on these, and this will take you to uh, Voodoo to go you know, buy the movie. But uh, the idea here is, uh, if I look at the page source, um, I can see that this is all a React component rendered on the server, now being placed onto the page. And here's my data that I used to render it um, on the server. These are the IDs of the movies. And I can turn, I could turn server side rendering off. So I could just say um, SSR false. And then you can see that my HTML uh, doesn't have uh, my page loads without the content now. Okay. Uh, the other thing I, I looked at is like uh, I looked at Flux. Uh, Flux is a way uh, uh, to do a kind of uni unidirectional uh, data flow. And I looked at one of their demo kits. Um, and this is kind of showing you isomorphic flux, running flux both on the server and the client. And I built a demo around that, running that in, in Nashorn. So you can, you can run a full flux application here as well. So um, this is my flux app. Uh, again, a very simple uh, controller here. But the, the really meat of the, the problem is, is this is a full flux app here with my actions, components, my stores, et cetera. So um, let me start that. And show you this is very simple hello world example. It just kind of goes through the whole uh, flux flow, so uh, it gives you an idea of how that works. And uh, this is uh, just a simple hello world. I can I can hit it from the server, and if I look at uh, the server state here, um, you see that, that uh, I've rendered this on the server, and I can and now I'm in a single page mode, single page app mode. I can navigate and do all that within within the browser. But then I can always hit back and, and refresh the page from, from the server by just clicking it like this. And now this is done from the server. So uh, that was it. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, go ahead. Glad to hear any. Yeah, do you guys have a couple questions? We, I think we've got a little bit of time. Dude, that was awesome. That's super cool. Okay, I have a question. Um, what? I've never actually seen someone use Safari to do debugging. Do you <laughs> actually use it? I worked at Apple for two years. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and so I had to use Safari. <laughs> I can learn a trick for, or two from you. Robert. Uh, I have a question about your benchmark. I'm not yeah. very familiar with the JVM because I'm a Ruby developer. Yeah. But why is it that? Oh, why is it that ah. the JVM or that Nashorn starts off slower but then catches up? Yeah. So, what what uh, what what Java is really known for is that initial comp compilation of your code is generating very naive kind of uh, so, uh, byte code, and it's looking through your execution path as uh, during the runtime, and it's doing everything you learned about in the, your compiler course at school, how it does optimizations, kind of you know moving the bytes around, you know eliminating dead code. So as, as it's executing, it's uh, realizing and, and seeing what are the, uh, the optimal execution paths of your code. So it, that's how it kind of warms up. Now, Node has something very similar, but because it's uh, tailored towards um, dynamic languages like JavaScript, it's able to do that much quicker. Java is tailored. The Java bytecode and the optimizer work really well if I have types to what, I, what I'm trying to optimize. So that's why it takes a little longer. Now, in Java 9, they are working on trying to guess the types ahead of time, and then that would allow the warm-up time to be much faster. So it's just-in-time compilation. It's yes. just taking time to... Yes. Wow. Cool. Right. Awesome. Let's give uh, Maxime another round of applause. That was amazing.